Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. Those of you who are first-time guests, we're glad that you're here today. Those of you who are watching us in the Cross Point Center, thank you for giving of your space from here to in there. I know we've got over 200 every week in there and also at 11 o'clock as well, but we're glad that you're joining us. And those of you who are joining us from home, I want to give a shout out to my wife and her three friends who are in the mountains right now, Chris, with her free three friends, Marta, Lori, and Kay. They're watching us online. Baby, I dress myself today. So you can, um, you can let me know how I did, and I'm sure that you will whenever I get home. She's going to say that you wore your outfit because my outfit is a black shirt. So, <laughs> but, but I do want you to know that those of you who are here for the first or second time, we love this place because this is a place of transformation. This is a place week in and week out. We get to see people's lives being transformed. And it's not only just those who maybe knew or on the fringes or things. God is constantly transforming all of us. God transforms me. In fact, I stand on this stage this morning as a person who has been transformed by God's amazing grace even this week. And, and I can prove it to you. Most of you know that I'm not a cat person, right? Right? You know that. But this morning, I have on some cat socks. <laughs> Somebody gave these to me, and I'm wearing them in honor of that gift. And so I have been transformed by wearing something that has a cat on it. Yes, as demonic as they are, I... <laughs> I, God is changing my heart. And so we're all about transformation. You know, school's about to start, and as Garrett has just prayed over our school systems and all of our students and all those are going, school and education has been a, a, a huge thing for generations and generations and generations. A philosopher by the name of uh, Jeremy Bentham um, in the 1860s believed that if we just teach people education and it was compulsory and required and we didn't teach people any morals or spiritual issues or we removed the Bible, just education enough would be enough to transform society. In fact, this is what he said. He said, if we could get universal and compulsory education by the end of the century, all of our social, political, and moral problems will be solved. He wrote this in 1860. He missed the mark on that, didn't he? About the same time, there was another man who believed in education as well. He was the Earl of Shaftesbury, and I don't know what they do in Shaftesbury, but uh, he wrote similar, but he included something very important. Here's what he wrote. Education without instruction in religious and moral principles will merely result in a race of clever devils. Boy, he has he proven to be true. And we live in a world that is filled with information, don't we? We have more information than any other time in the history of our world. Yet with all of this information and all of this information that's global, we have not been able to achieve a global utopia. And even with all of the information that we have, many people think that just information alone will solve our issues. But what we've discovered that with more information, there's even more complexities in the world. Because some of the most educated people have been some of the most notoriously wicked people. And they've used them against the common good for the world. And in fact, in America, we have more college graduates in these days that have what we, can be, we could call or educated idiots. Yep. And here's what I mean by that. We've lost the sense because of knowledge, we don't have wisdom. We can no longer define what a woman is. And as a result of that, we'll throw her into women's sports and they will create a lot of difficulties and harm. We no longer can define what a gender is. So we let individuals define that so they won't hurt themselves. And what do doctors do? They mutilate their bodies and hurt them so they won't have to hurt themselves. We can no longer define what a terrorist group is over a people group. So what do we do? We throw all of our support for a terrorist group and we support the very people who would kill us if they could. And what has happened is we've lost sense of wisdom. 
We have a lot of knowledge, but we're losing the sight of the ability to think wisely. An old Arab proverb says this, he that knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool, shun him. He that knows not and knows that he knows not is simple, teach him. He that knows and knows not that he knows is asleep, wake him. And he that knows and knows that he knows is a wise man, follow him. One of the things we don't need in our culture as much anymore is the information as much as we need wisdom. Now, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Let me give that to you. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. And boy, are we living in a time today where you can accumulate any kind of information you want at a click of a button. When I was growing up, if you needed information, we had to go to, you remember the Encyclopedia Britannica? We all had, the, how many of you those have, had those in your home? Every year, they would have to print new ones because the old ones would become a little bit obsolete. But that's what we did. Now, with one click and chat GPT, you can write anything in seconds, and we got more information. But knowledge is just the accumulation of information. But wisdom is the right application of truth. It's the right application of truth. And truth is what we need. And we live in a world today that's saying there is no absolute truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And what happens is people become confused. And people are not walking wisely anymore. One of the things that we see in the pages of Scripture in the Old Testament that the words wise and wisdom appear over 300 times. 300 times, over 100 times in the book of Proverbs alone. And if there's anything we need, we need wisdom. We need to have wisdom to know how to provide for our families. Husbands need wisdom and know how to love their wives. Wives need wisdom and know how to support and love their husbands. Parents need wisdom and know how to shepherd their children in a world filled with truthlessness. And we need children who need to learn wisdom because they're growing up in a world that's far different than what their parents and their grandparents grew up in. College students need wisdom to know how to navigate through all of these cultural issues of our day. And we need wisdom to be able to walk wisely in a world that rejects the message of the gospel. We need wisdom in knowing how to stand distinctively different from the world. We need wisdom that we can model the character of Christ in all that we do and all that we say. And if there's anything we need, we need wisdom. We've been studying through the book of James for the last two months. And we find ourselves at the end of chapter 3, verses 13 to 18 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, turn to James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And what James does in this section is he's going to talk to us about wisdom. Now, the theme of James is a faith that works. And a faith that works, he breaks this book into four sections. We've seen a faith that works produces stability in our lives through trials, through temptations, through the truth of God's word, through trust, and those kinds of things. But not only does it produce this, this issue of stability, but a faith that works produces charity. We learn how to love one another through the way we view one another, no favoritism, through the way we demonstrate faith in other people's lives and through our tongue and through our words. But now James moves to the third section. And this section, he moves from stability and he moves from charity to humility. And he paints in this next section for the next three weeks that we look at is going to be dealing with issues of humility. And one of those issues is to walk in wisdom. And he sets the whole thing up for us in James chapter 3, verse 13, with a rhetorical question. And the rhetorical question is this. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct... Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. He's basically asking the question, do you think you're wise? Do you think you have understanding? Well, let's take the test. If you really think you're wise, if you really think you have understanding, that's going to come out by the way that you live your life. And it's going to come out by the attitude of your heart. 
If you're walking in good conduct and you're walking in a life of humility, then you probably are walking in wisdom. But if you're not, you're walking in the wrong kind of wisdom. In other words, he puts it this way. Wisdom equals lifestyle. Whatever you choose to be your source of wisdom, listen carefully, whatever you choose to be your source of wisdom will determine and will demonstrate what your lifestyle is. Because your lifestyle is always going to be flowing from something. So here's what James is about to do. He's going to tell us that there are two kinds of wisdom in the world. There is a natural wisdom and there's a supernatural wisdom. And with the natural wisdom, there's a specific origin of where that comes from. And with supernatural wisdom, there's a specific origin for that. With natural wisdom, there are certain characteristics that will flow. And out of supernatural wisdom, there are certain characteristics. And for each one, there's a specific result. So here's what James is going to do. He's going to pull no punches again. He's going to go right to the heart of the issue. And he's going to tell us two kinds of wisdom. And here's my goal today. Is that as we unpack these verses of James. And as the Holy Spirit has given them for us today. Here's what I want to ask you to ask yourself. What kind of wisdom is portraying my lifestyle? If people looked at my life and they looked at the choices that I make. Which kind of wisdom would people say I am walking by? And if it's not supernatural, then God is going to challenge our hearts today to be able to do that which is right. We're going to have some fun with this because we're going to see the reality of the difference between natural wisdom and supernatural wisdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Guide us in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin where James begins in verses 15, 14 and 15. Here's the first kind of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Now, what part of this don't you understand? James is very straightforward in this. He tells us the origin of natural wisdom is the human heart. He said it's from your heart. The problem is this. Every human heart left to its own devices is what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can know it? Every human heart apart from Christ is depraved. It's totally depraved. That's a theological term. It doesn't mean it's as bad as it can be. It just means it will never be what God intended it to be. Because sin infects every single aspect of our lives. Every faculty, our emotions, our thoughts, our passions, our actions, our deeds. We have a sinful nature and we are born with that sinful nature. And as a result of that, natural wisdom just flows straight out of the human heart that has been fallen in nature. And so he's saying that that's where it derives itself from. However, in this, he gives us natural wisdom, and he's going to give us six characteristics of natural wisdom. You've got your notes. You can write them down pretty quickly. They're very simple. Here's the first one. Natural wisdom has a sourness to it. It has a sourness to it. He says that that wisdom that comes from the heart has bitter jealousy. The word bitter in the Greek literally means undrinkable. It is water that is so sour. Get this. The, the description of it is it makes your face pucker. It's like having a permanent lemon head in your mouth that never gets sweet. It's like a sour patch you know, um, that never turns to sweetness. There is a certain bitterness to, to this natural wisdom that flows. And it comes with jealousy. And what is jealousy? Jealousy is just simply envy towards someone else. And natural wisdom has this action within us to make us want to be sour and envious of people that have what we don't have. It's the kind of wisdom that Cain used when he killed his own brother, Abel. And he thought he could hide him from God. And God discovered that his blood has cried out to me. 
It's the kind of envy and bitter jealousy that the Pharisees had toward Jesus. They hated him. They despised him so much that what did they do? They were the ones that orchestrated his death. In fact, you know that it was Pontius Pilate who said this, that he recognized that it was their jealous envy that put Jesus to death. And what's interesting is in Paul's list in Romans chapter 1 of the kinds of sins that lead to depravity, bitter jealousy is followed immediately by murder and strife. And what happens when people are bitter and they're sour and their wisdom that flows from their heart is filled from resentment and anger because somebody else has done something to them, then the natural result is they may not kill them, but they may want them dead. I don't know if you read a couple of years ago about a mom who actually hired a hitman to kill a young cheerleader who was competing for the same position that her daughter was competing for. And she had a person kill a a, a cheerleader so her daughter can win something that she did not have an opportunity to pursue. That is the wisdom that comes from bitter jealousy. Have you ever seen a bitter person? They're almost puckered all the time. And and they always have that sour look on their face because they're constantly thinking, how can I get revenge and how can I get back at this situation? So natural wisdom carries with it a lot of sourness. Here's the second thing James says. Natural wisdom has a self-seeking attitude. He says it's selfish ambition, selfish ambition. It's self-centered, self-seeking. Natural wisdom wants to always take care of yourself first. It's always going to be about me first. And what's interesting is the word selfish ambition literally means in the Greek the spinning of wool, the spinning of yarn, the spinning of something that can be fashioned for my own good. You know what it became later used for? Politicians. The spinning of stories and the spinning of things. And boy, don't we see a lot of spinning these days. We see individuals who are changing their platforms just try to win um, um, uh, an election. And everything is being spun according to what they hope will lead them to that. And so what happens is this self-centered wisdom a lot of times is about ourselves. I I read this story some time ago about a little boy and a little girl, brother, sister. She was two years older than her brother. And they were having a debate and an argument over a brownie. There was one brownie left. It was in a container, and they were fighting over the container. No, I get it. The little girl says, I get it because I'm the oldest one, and I deserve it. The little boy says, no, I should get it because I'm the youngest, and you've eaten more brownies in your life than I have, so I've got to make up for it. And the mom is listening to all this, and she says, kids, 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 you don't need to fight over this. Let me ask you a question. And she looks at her older daughter. She says, what would Jesus do? And she said, Jesus would give it to the other person. She said, that's right. And she just smiled bigly, and she looked at her little brother and said, okay, you be Jesus. That's, so, that's the wisdom that's natural to the human heart. Is it not? Don't you always want to be the first in line? Don't you want to be the first one through a red light? Don't you want to be the one to cut everybody off as you're coming through Porter's Neck and trying to go north in that left lane and run past them and run them into the Exxon station with a smile on your face? Say, I'm just more aggressive than you are and more talented. You, you, That's the natural wisdom that flows from us. Not only can there be a sourness that flows from our heart because we want to get even, but there's always this self-centered thing that we want to pursue. Here's the third thing he says. Natural wisdom leads to self-deceit. Self-deceit. Whenever you are living by a man-centered, religious philosophy of your life, it's always going to be self-centered. It's going to be self-centered, and it's going to lead you to deny the truth. Some translations literally say, lie to the truth. In other words, you're rejecting the truth. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 that many people are suppressing the truth. And when people live by natural 
wisdom of their own heart that's flowing out of the darkness of their sinful life, what ends up happening is they no longer concern themselves with truth. They want to put truth aside. They want to write their own truth. They want to create what they have. They want to be a self-made person. The problem with a self-made person is self-made people typically worship their creator, which is themselves. And what do they end up doing? They jettison truth for the sake of what they want to hold to. Many years ago, there was an actress by the name of Shirley MacLaine. Some of you may remember her. She wrote a book called Out on a Limb. Um, and I kind of resemble that book because I fell off a limb. And, uh, but in that book, what she does is she rejects all kind of other truth. And she says, the only truth and the only important thing is you and what you believe. Here's what she wrote, in fact. She said, the most pleasurable journey you take is through yourself. The only sustaining love involvement is with yourself. When you look back on your life and you try to figure out where you've been and where you're going, when you look at your work, your love affairs, your marriages, your children, your pain, your happiness, when you examine all that closely, what you really find out is that the only person you really go to bed with is yourself. The only thing you have is working to the consummation of your own identity. And that's what I've been trying to do all my life. And that's what most people do. They lie to themselves. They reject the truth of God. And they believe that they're going to be the source of all authoritative truth. And they pursue themselves. Here's what Blaise Pascal wrote. It is in vain, O man, that you seek within yourselves the cure for your miseries. All your insight only leads you to the knowledge that it is not in yourselves that you will discover true and good. A few years ago, there was a phrase going around that a lot of people were catching hold to. It was called, it, the phrase said, simply said, you are enough. You are enough. You don't need all of that. You're enough. You don't need people to encourage you. You're enough. And the whole thing caught on, you are enough. And what's sad about that is many churches caught on to that. And I've heard preachers preaching that message to their congregation. Listen to me, you are enough. And that kind of preaching is sending people to hell with a smile on their face. And here's why. You are not enough. The whole reason Jesus went to the cross and to die in your place and to face the wrath of God and to be tortured where you should be tortured is because you are not enough. He is the only one who is enough to do what you and I need to have a relationship with God. And those who are walking by the human heart of depravity and are believing their own lies, thinking they're enough, they will never be enough. And so the human heart says... It's going to lie to you. It's deceptive in all of these ways. Here's another one he says. Now he gets into the last three, which we call the unholy trinity. Natural wisdom is secular. The word secular just simply means earthly. The word earthly just means this. It just means that it views life only from a horizontal view. There's not going to be any thought of spiritual things. There's not going to be thought of God. There's not going to be thought of some vertical approach to life. It's just horizontal. And everything we can figure out in humanity is good enough. Our own accomplishments will be good enough. Our own discoveries will be good enough. Our own thoughts will be good enough. We're going to just remove all of the spiritual things because in humanity we can accomplish everything we need. And that's the secular pursuit of life. And from that, what has flown out of that? We've seen all kinds of doctrines that have come out of that. Darwin has created an entire theory that came out of this secular thought. The survival of the fittest. And if morality is not important, and if eternity doesn't exist, then what does it matter how you live your life just so you survive? And as a result of that, all kinds of philosophies that are absent from God have taken over the mainstream of our culture and they're treated as though they're scientific fact. Evolution is one. Because evolution is just the removal of the existence of an intelligent being so that way I do not have to give an account one day before the one who created everything in me. And so what do we do? 
We just suppress it. Oriel Wysong, who was a great scientist and philosopher, wrote these words. He says, evolution is not a formulation of the true scientific method. They realize evolution means the initial formation of unknown organisms from unknown chemicals produced in an atmosphere or ocean of unknown composition under unknown conditions with organisms have then climbed up an unknown evolutionary ladder by an unknown process leaving unknown evidence. There is not one shred of evidence that proves evolutionists are right, but they still insist on calling evolution fact in spite of the facts. What's the, comp- the major word there? It's unknown. And all of that is a secular approach to saying, you know what? Let's leave God out. But then there's a, another one. Natural wisdom, he says, is sensual. It's unspiritual. The word sensual actually means animalistic. It means it, it, it has the instincts of an animal. There's not a whole lot of reason to it. We just kind of run on what we feel. What is my passion? If it feels good, do it. You deserve it. Do whatever your heart desires. Follow your heart. That's the worst advice you can ever receive. But what happens is this central approach says, you know what? You just listen to your own heart. You listen to your own passions. You run after it. Don't worry about all these other things. It's unspiritual. It's all about yourself. I read about these two guys that went to a restaurant together, and it was a seafood restaurant. They both ordered flounder, and when they ordered it, the waitress brought two of the plates. She put them right in the center of the table long ways. She didn't want to give one to the other and one not to the other because one flounder was obviously larger than the other flounder. And so the one guy grabbed the large flounder, pulled it to himself, took the small flounder, and gave it to his friend. And the friend looked at him, he says... Well, you got some kind of nerve there. He said, well, what would you have done? He said, well, I would have done the right thing. He said, what's that? I would have taken the small one and gave you the large one. He says, isn't that what we got? (laughs) And sometimes what we do, we can shroud our righteousness in what (laughs) we really call passion. And what happens is we all have the tendency to do that. And it's sensual. We're driven by these passions of our flesh. And here's the last one. And this is the most serious. Natural wisdom is satanically inspired. He says it's demonic. This wisdom that does not come from above but originates from a fallen human heart becomes to be inspired by the devil himself. I want you to think. Of these last three. We're talking about secular. We're talking about sensual. We're talking about this satanically inspired. In the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were there. The devil used the same three things on them. That he used on Jesus in the wilderness. And he will use on you and me today. He said look at this fruit. And you're not supposed to eat of this tree. But did God really say? And the day that you eat of it, you will not die. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then it says this. Eve saw that the fruit was appealing. She saw that it would be good for her taste. And she saw that it would make her like God. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. He used that in the garden. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he said, turn this bread to stone, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Look at this. You will receive all these kingdoms of the world, and everyone will worship you, the boastful pride of life. He still uses the same thing in our lives. And here's the thing that he wants us to do. He wants us to doubt God. He wants us to question his goodness. He wants us to put away truth, and he wants us to walk in a way That fills us with pride. You want to know the greatest sin of Satan? Pride. He wanted to be God. And let me tell you what pride is. Pride is the idolatrous worship of yourself. And pride is the national religion of hell. Every single person in hell is there because of pride. And they followed the one who has enticed them and led them to that way. It is satanic. And it is led by demonic forces to move us away from the truth of God. That's why Paul wrote 
that the gospel has been blinded or, or, or people have been blinded by demonic forces where they cannot see the glory of the gospel. So what is the result? Here's the result of natural wisdom, disorder and depravity. Here's what he says. For where jealous and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. You want to know what this kind of wisdom leads to? It's chaos. It's confusion. It's heartache. It's disappointment. It's brokenness. And it goes and flows with every vile, every kind of evil, imaginary thing. If you don't believe this is true, just look at the wisdom that our world is trying to pour upon us. Listen to the wisdom that's trying to be taught in political circles and certain parties. Look at the wisdom that's being trying to displayed even when Planned Parenthood pulls out a vehicle for free abortions and vasectomies in the public. Is that from God? Those kinds of things flow from a natural kind of wisdom that ultimately will lead to disorder and depravity of every kind. Now, here's what James does. He warns us about this. But he doesn't drop the mic and walk off the stage. What does he do? He gives us the other kind of wisdom. And in verse 17, he says, But the wisdom from above is first pure. It's peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason, it's full of mercy and good fruits, it's impartial and sincere. So he gives us a number of characteristics that we're going to go through very quickly because they're short. Here's what he says. Supernatural wisdom, first of all, is wisdom that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's from a transformed heart that has been forgiven and redeemed by Jesus Christ. And it is, first of all, pure. The word pure literally means holy. It means this. The wisdom that comes from God is a pure kind of wisdom. It's not contaminated by the things of the world. It's not contaminated with impurities. It is the very character. It's the very heart of God. So how do you know if something's wise or not? Does it reflect the character of God? Does it reflect the desire of the heart of your heavenly father? Does it reflect the true teachings of scripture? And if it does, then you can know that it's pure. It's set apart. It's without any contamination of the world. And it is holy in nature. The second characteristic is that it promotes peace. Wisdom from God does not incite rebellion and sin. It brings about peace. And James is writing kind of a reflection of the Beatitudes that his brother, Jesus, taught. His half-brother, Jesus, taught. He's talking about that those um, who, who are peacemakers shall be called, what? Sons and daughters of God. And so the mark of a person who walks in wisdom, it's peaceful. It brings about this understanding of truth. And rather than creating chaos, which God is not the author of confusion, it brings about an understanding that, yes, this is right. And this is holy. Here's a third. Supernatural wisdom is patient. It is slow. It's patient. It is gentle. This is one of the harder words to translate in this passage because there's no one English word that can capture it all. It is one of those, those, those qualities that just really is kind. It's gentle. It's patient with people. It's long-suffering. It puts up with people because God puts up with us. And he deals with so many faults and failures in our own life. And this kind of wisdom from God is one that is kind of patient. You remember that commercial where this guy is, he just poured concrete. He had just smoothed out all the concrete on this sidewalk. And he's on the last little section. And he looks up and there's this four little kid, this four-year-old kid that walked the whole length of it. And he's standing in front of him just smiling. And he says, Hi. And the man doing the concrete goes, hi. <laughs> he picks him up. He wipes the concrete off of him, pats him on the head, and he starts back over again. Wisdom from God 
is the kind of wisdom that's patient. Here's another one. Supernatural wisdom makes one pliable. It says this. It's reasonable. The word in the Greek literally means easily persuaded. It does not mean easily persuaded by losing your convictions and not standing on truth. It means this. I'm not going to argue with you about everything because there are areas in my life that I don't have right. It's a person, a wise person who's walking with wisdom from above recognizes I don't have everything right. I get things wrong. And so what I'm doing is I'm open for you to correct me. I'm open for the Holy Spirit to use you to challenge me in my life to teach me something that I need to learn. Listen, about a Three months ago, I had an individual come to me and challenged me on something in my life. And he was right. And I could have bowed up very easily and said, how dare you come to me? I'm the senior pastor. You don't have a right to question me in this. And he came to me and he confronted me on something of an attitude of my heart. And immediately I knew he's right. He is exactly right. How do I knew that? Because the Holy Spirit was already convicting me on that. And rather than fighting it, I was teachable in the sense of saying, brother, thank you for doing that. Thank you for having the boldness to come to me, to speak to me about an issue in my life that the Holy Spirit wants me to get right. And that kind of wisdom is the wisdom that's open to others ministering to your hearts. That's wisdom from above. How about this one? Supernatural wisdom is productive, very productive, Full of mercy. It's active. It doesn't just talk about things. It does things. And this kind of supernatural wisdom is one that ministers to people actively. I read about a young man who was in the hospital. He was visiting the hospital. He was hurrying down the hall because he had gotten a call from relatives about a sick relative that was in the hospital. And as he was walking very, very quickly down the hall, the nurse grabbed him and said, listen, listen, this way, this way. Brings him into a room and said, he's been asking for you. She sat him down right next to a man who was in the bed and who was dying. The young man just took his hand and held his hand and held his hand. After about an hour, the old man passed away. The young man got up and he got the nurse. He said, I believe he just passed away. And she said, well, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he said, by the way, who, who is he? She said, well, you're not his son? He was asking for his son. You're not his son? He said, no, I've never met him before. She said, why did you stay? He said, because he needed a son. That's mercy. And that's the kind of mercy that wisdom displays because it's the kind of mercy that God demonstrates to us, isn't it? Here's the last one. Supernatural wisdom is void of partiality. It's, it's, it's not partial. It means that it is, um, doesn't show favoritism. That wisdom applies to people wherever they are, whoever they are, and it's given freely. I said that was the last one. There's one more. Supernatural wisdom is without pretense, which means this. It's not hypocritical. It doesn't play act. It is the real thing. Now, what is the result of supernatural wisdom? Here it is. The cycle of righteousness. It's a cycle of righteousness. Where the other one promotes disorder and depravity, this brings a cycle of righteousness. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What James is speaking about here is the law of the harvest. The law of harvest says this. You reap if you sow. You reap what you sow. You reap later than you sow. And you always reap more than you sow. And so as we are sowing seeds of righteousness, some of those bring about a great harvest immediately. But some of them are planted and tucked away in the ground. And as the Holy Spirit begins to do that work, those seeds of wisdom and righteousness begin to take root. And eventually they begin to grow. And the cycle continues over and over. So what James is saying here is there are two kinds of wisdom. There is an earthly wisdom, the natural wisdom. And there is a supernatural wisdom. The question is which one are you living by? Which of these two demonstrate the character of your life? Now, our heart's desire may be to live by a supernatural wisdom, 
But we may find ourselves from time to time listening to the wisdom of the world. In the Rockefeller Center in New York City, there are, in that <laughs> building, there are four murals that are painted on the wall. It's painted by an artist by the name of Jose Maria Cert. And he painted four different mur- murals on the, the walls. The first mural is a picture of, a, of, of an ancient man, a primitive man, working with primitive tools, trying to survive in a very difficult environment. The second mural is a picture of a man who has created tools. And by the use of those tools, he has created some comfort by which he and his family can live. The third mural is a picture of the Industrial Revolution where there has been the creation of machines where man is both master and slaves of the machine and great industries and cities have been built. But then the fourth mural is really one that seems to be out of place. The fourth mural is a picture of Jesus on the mountainside teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And with the Sermon on the Mount, people are are trying to desperately reach him, men, women, children. And as they're climbing up, the caption written under that picture are these words. Man's ultimate destiny depends not on whether he can learn new lessons or make new discoveries or conquests, but on his acceptance of the lesson that was taught him over 2,000 years ago, the very wisdom of Christ. Where do you get supernatural wisdom? It's only from a relationship with Jesus. It's only from a heart that's been transformed by Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul captures this all through the the, the New Testament. He says, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He writes in Colossians that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Then he writes in Romans, he says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Here's what God is asking you today. What wisdom guides your life? Which wisdom are you pursuing? It measures by what you believe and how you act and how you live. Are you under the supernatural wisdom of God? Then let me ask you this. Why, believer, do you run after the wisdom of the world? Why? You have everything you need for life and godliness in Jesus. Pursue that wisdom and let that wisdom be the character of your life. The second question I would ask is if you're here today and you're not a believer, here would be my question. Why are you pursuing the wisdom of the world that will never satisfy nor give you life? That wisdom can only be found in a relationship with Christ. And my friend, if you are not walking with Jesus today, the invitation of the Lord Jesus himself is before you in saying, leave the things of the world They will not lead you to anything but disorder and death. Come to me. I will forgive you of your sin. I will give you eternal life. I will grant to you a wisdom that you can't even comprehend that will change the course of your life for eternity. So James hits us again. Ask what wisdom are you living by? And as we go through this season, particularly this political season, and everything that we're hearing, ask yourself, is that something that would be from God? Or is that something that would be from a human heart that is depraved and needs redemption? Is that something that will honor God? Or is that something that will just satisfy me? May we walk in the wisdom that brings glory to God and that will bring benefit to our lives and the lives of others. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your truth. May we walk in wisdom that is pure and peaceful. Father, that's pliable in our hearts, that's productive. And may we live in such a way that the way we live our lives will be a demonstration of your very character in us. 
And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.